Oh, I forgot this. Uh, we Friday night we went. To, uh, Diane and I and and uh, Bill and Linda went to the Jesus Revolution yeah. movie, and um, we got there and. Uh, uh, you guys were there and Rich and Rachel and it was sold out. There was like 20 people uh, at that showing that were trying to get into that showing from our church and a couple that were from another church uh, at the uh, Gateway Theater. That was just that showing. It was sold out. If you've not seen the Jesus Revolution, I don't know when it first came out, whether Friday was the first day or not. It was okay. It's a great movie. It's a great movie. It's a story of Calvary Chapel. Uh, it kind of focuses on Greg Laurie's perspective, but it's just a great picture, not only of what God has done, but what he's going to do again. Amen. And so if you've not seen that, uh, grab somebody and take them to the movie. Uh, I I promise you, you will enjoy it. Um, this week, we're reading or studying through 1 Corinthians 7, 8, and 9 for our connect groups. Um, if you uh, are not in a connect group, we have one that meets here on Monday nights. And so uh, you can come on Monday nights, and I think it's at 7 o'clock, so we invite you to participate in that. Uh, so 1 Corinthians 7, 8, and 9. Um, t- today, I'm going to focus primarily on chapters uh, eight and nine and a little into 10, but I want to speak for a moment about chapter seven. So 1 Corinthians seven. The main topic that Paul covers in 1 Corinthians seven is marriage. How many are married in the house this morning? Just raise your hands, okay? So I want you to know guys and gals, if you're married um, and you, you want some, just some great Great help in your marriage. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 7, the first few verses. It's awesome. It's, uh, it's, it's just, you will be glad that you did it. But Paul addresses all kinds of people in this chapter. He doesn't just single out the married people. And I want to mention some things that he says. Um, he says in verses 12 through uh, 16, he talks about believers who have non-believing spouses. Understand that When this letter was written to the church in Corinth and in that time of history, um, there was a a lot of opposition to the gospel. And there were a lot of people that had committed their life to Christ and their spouses weren't in with them. It was so polarizing. And so Paul addresses the people that were married to others who had unbelieving spouses. And he said, I want you to just stay the course by your actions, you sanctify them is the language that he uses. And that doesn't mean that by your actions, you save them and they go to heaven. But by your actions, you're the light in the home. And regardless of all the adversity that you're going through, he just tells you if you're here today in the house and your spouse, your husband and wife isn't a believer, Paul would say, just stay the course. Don't go anywhere. Don't try to separate from them. It's just great practical advice for 2023. And then he says something that really troubled me when I was a kid. Uh, Before I got married, in verses 25 through 26, he says to the unmarried or the virgins or the betrothed, he says, in view of the present distress, stay as you are. Really what Paul was saying is if you're not married, uh, if you're you're a son or a daughter and you haven't been betrothed to somebody, he says because of the distress that's going on in the world right now, it would be better for you to not get married. Now, Paul was speaking um, about some kind of activity that was going on in Corinth, in Corinth at the time. But when I read that as a young man, I thought, oh, that's terrible. That, I want to get married for all the obvious reasons, right? And uh, I didn't want to wait. I, didn't, you know, I was like, oh, no, don't tell me that. But we don't know what was going on in Corinth at that time. But here's what we do know. At that time of history, Nero was soon to become the Caesar of the world, and Nero was brutally violent towards Christians. He he killed all kinds of Christian believers, and we read in Hebrews 11 some of the things that Christians went through. The, The tolerance for Christianity in that time of history was waning. People were very intolerant, and so When you read this chapter, you have to understand and take it in context. God is not against marriage. Everybody said, hallelujah, right? (laughs) He's for marriage. He's for you sticking it out. He's for you staying together. He's for it. But at that time of history, something was going on. And Paul said, right now might not be the best time to get married. Uh, So we just apply that. 
right now, who knows what our world's becoming, but there will become a day, as Jesus said in the Gospels, where, you know, it'll be difficult for pregnant women and people that are, are newly married, it'll just be difficult. You can see that coming. Uh, so that's what Paul was addressing in chapter seven. But I do wanna encourage you, um, oh, on this, we know that Paul was married. Uh, the reason that we know he was married is because he was a member of the Sanhedrin, and you couldn't be a member of the Sanhedrin unless you were married. Uh, he was a good Pharisee. He was a good Jew. It was shameful if you were a Jew not to be married. So we're very certain that Paul was married. But he also says in chapter 7, at this time he indicates that he was no longer married, right? Something had happened to his wife. And we don't know what happened to Paul's wife. It's very possible that she was one of those unbelieving spouses that didn't want to stay the course with Paul. Paul was at one time, as a Pharisee, he was in kind of the elite privileged group. You know, he was a person that was honored. And as he says in 1 Corinthians chapter five, I am now the scum of the earth. And his wife might have said, I don't want anything to do with you or this new lifestyle you've chosen. I'm out of here. And if that's what happened, and I believe that is what happened, um, that may, may be the very thing that Paul wrestled with, that thorn in the flesh, that pain in his side that he pleaded with God. Can you see Paul losing his wife because she's an unbeliever and then him pleading with God three times, God, please, God, please, God. God, please. And then what did the Lord say to Paul? My grace is sufficient. And Paul used that mark on his life to be a special voice in the lives of other people who suffered in the rest of his ministry. And so we don't know that for certain, but I really believe that is probably what Paul was relating to when he talked about, you know, the thorn in the flesh, losing his wife because of the sake of the gospel. But I want to just encourage you to read chapter 7. Uh, before you go to your connect groups because there are some questions relating to that. This morning, we're gonna focus on chapters eight, nine, and part of 10. So if you have your study Bibles, would you open them to 1 Corinthians chapter eight? I think it's uh, page 2022, something like that. Um, it, we should all be on the same page if you have our study Bibles. Uh, incidentally, we did get new ones this week. We got the bigger print version. So if you wanna trade your old model in for a new one, um, Pastor Angela is over that. So 1 Corinthians chapter 8, would you follow along with me? I, I just got to take a deep breath and pray. Lord, I want to just surrender these next few moments to you. Lord, would you just, would you just kind of seal this room off so that we can receive what you have for us to receive? Lord, your presence is here, your spirit is here. And you want to teach or instruct us today through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Verse one, now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. You notice there that the words, all of us possess knowledge are in quotations. When we talk in our language, we'll say quote, end quote, you know, we'll, we'll make a statement. And usually when we reference, quote, end quote, we're, we're quoting something that is well known, right? That's what Paul is doing here, that all of us possess knowledge. Just, it was a, there was something in, in the church in Corinth, there's something in their culture, their city, it was, that was just a common saying. We know that all of us, quote, unquote, possess knowledge, and then he says this, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. This is the foundation that Paul lays for this principle that he's going to apply that, that we will implement hopefully into our lives. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone in this room right now thinks they know something, he does not yet know as he ought to know, but if you love God, then you're known by God. It's the only way that we can have true knowledge and true understanding about God and be known by God is we begin from a basis of love. Love puffs, knowledge puffs up, love builds up. Now verse four, he gets into kind of the meat of the argument. If you have a pen, would you underline this first statement in verse four in your study Bibles? It's, the, it's kind of the whole key. know that an idol has no real existence. Everybody that understands that, say amen. amen. An idol is nothing. Paul says this, 
It's wood, it's steel, it's silver, it's gold. It's, it's, it has no existence. It's just a man-made item. So, as to the eating of food offered to idols, an idol is nothing. And that there is no God, chap, capital G-O-D, but one. Verse five, although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, little g gods, as indeed there are many little g gods and many little l lords, yet for us there's one God, the Father from whom all things uh, are all things and from whom we exist, and one Lord, his name is Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. Now, just to, to explain what Paul is saying there in that long run-on sentence, he says there's, there's one God, capital G-O-D, but then he says what seems like a contradiction, we also know there are many gods and many lords. All he is doing there is acknowledging what was the state in Corinth. There were five major gods that were worshiped in Corinth just routinely. Corinth is adjacent to Athens. Remember when Paul went to Athens uh, in Acts 18 or 19? And he says, I see that you have idols all over your city. And there's even an idol to the unknown God. He said, let me tell you about the unknown God. Well, Athens was right next to Corinth. They're both in the, in the nation of Greece. There were just all kinds of gods. So Paul is saying, there are indeed all kinds of little G gods, idols, little L lords, but for us, there's only, we believe, only one God and one Lord. That's what he's saying in that long sentence. Verse seven, however, not everyone possesses this knowledge that there is one God and that the rest of them are idols and they're nothing. Not everyone understands that. Lots of people you work with don't understand that. But some, through former association with idols, some through their previous lifestyles, they eat food as it's really offered to an idol and their conscience being weak is defiled. Verse eight, Paul says, food will not commend us to God. We're no worse off if we do not eat and no better off if we do, including eating food sacrificed to idols. It's, it's quite a statement that Paul makes there. He's, he's saying an idol is nothing. It's, it's just, it's an idol. And you could eat food offered to an idol or you could choose not to eat food offered to an idol. I know none of us wrestle with this, but I'm gonna make it applicable in a minute. He said, you, you could eat it or not eat it. it. Rich, you're as holy and righteous as anybody as I know, and you could choose not to eat food offered to an idol, but you're no closer to God than Mandy in front of you, and she eats food offered to idols all the time. No, it has no bearing on how you are with God. That's what Paul is saying here. You're no closer, no farther away. Now think about that. We're in this culture in Corinth where idolatry was just rampant and it had ruined people's lives. People, as Paul says, were previously associated with it. I mean, it just ruined their lives. And Paul says, it doesn't matter. It's just food. Everybody say it's just food, right? It's just food, Kirk. That's what Paul's trying to get the point across. I don't know if I'm doing it, but hopefully I am. But then he says, verse nine, but take care that this right of yours, Rich, does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who has knowledge, that is just an idol, that's nothing. If anyone sees you who has knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged if his conscience is weak to eat food offered to idols. And so by your knowledge that an idol is nothing and food is just food, the weak person, the one who was previously exposed to idolatry, the, as Paul says, you know, the one with the previous knowledge, the weak person sees you eating that and they are destroyed, the brother whom Christ died. Thus, sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it's weak, you sin against Christ. Your freedom to do what you are free to do is now sin because you're sinning against a brother. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, 
Paul says, I'll never eat meat again, lest I make them stumble. I want to just take a couple of minutes and explain this issue of why they offered meat to idols. Um, The five gods that were worshipped in Corinth, uh, people believed that those gods were responsible for every good thing in their life. they They were responsible for the harvest. They were responsible for you doing well at your job, getting promoted at your job. They were responsible for your children's welfare. They were responsible for the fact that you would have children. They, they saw those idols, it's just an idol, but they, they saw that those idols were the source of every good thing. And the way that you got that idol's favor was to sacrifice to it. And the common sacrifice was meat. Now I know this is all foreign to us, but... If we went back in time and we were in Corinth, we would be in the very same boat they are, they're in, not having been exposed to Christianity. We would be sacrificing meat to the idols that we believed were responsible for every good in our life. We'd be right there with them. And if you believe that this little idol is responsible for my kids' welfare or the, my harvest being good or my crops going or the rain coming, if I believe that, I'm going to give that little idol the best cuts of meat that I have, right? The back strap, the, the, the tri-tip, the prime rib, whatever. You're not going to bring baloney to a God that you think is responsible for your favor, okay? This is just the way they lived. Well, remember, there's a half a million to 750,000 people that lived in Corinth. It was the roundabout for the world, the intersection of the world. People from all over lived there. And... Most of them worshiped these other gods. Now think about the amount of beef (laughs) that would have been brought to the temples. I mean, thousands of pounds of some of the best cuts of meat that you could get were brought to these temples to sacrifice. And the priests that were over all those sacrifices probably took the best cuts, but they couldn't possibly eat it all. So they would take the leftover meat they would put it in, sell it back to the meat markets, Costco markdown bin, and you could buy, and you could buy two ninety nine chuck, or you could buy two ninety nine prime rib. The only difference is one was offered to an idol as a sacrifice, the other wasn't. And there were just like you, there were lots of Christians who would say, "Who cares? It's just meat." And so they would buy that meat and they would eat it. And then there were those on the other side of the church who came from that lifestyle and they would see that and they would be enticed by that to even go back to their old lifestyle. Entice them, uh, it opened up a door of memories, just a dark side of their life that they would rather forget. And it was tearing the church apart. Would you eat meat sacrificed to an idol, Calvary? Would you, how, how would you feel about that? It's just meat. Let's say that um, your neighbor invited you over for a barbecue and they had smoked chicken, they brought it off the Traeger. I mean, it's it's just the best chicken you've ever had in your life and you wolf it down and you have seconds. I mean, it's just a, it's a great time and you say, man, where did you get that meat? And your friends as well, you know, my my neighbors are kind of weird people, but um, they raise chickens And uh, about once a month, all these cars show up to their house and people get out and they have these weird outfits on. They're all dressed in black and then there's all this noise and they're killing all their chickens in the backyard and they're dancing around the fire and they're they're saying things and chanting things and doing things. He said, I don't even want to look at what's going on there. But the strangest thing, the next morning, my neighbor always brings over these dead chickens and said, hey, I got all this meat I can't use. So that's where I got the meat. If that happened to you, would there be part of you that would think, I don't know if I want to eat that chicken anymore? There's people in this room would say, who cares? It's just chicken, right? John Bender, you're one of those people, right? I'd be like, it's just chicken. And then there's other people that would say, I don't think I can eat that chicken. Kind of those that came from the legalistic side. Not saying you didn't, but. Or let's say you were looking for a house to buy and you just fell in love with this cute little starter home and you get the seller disclosure statement. Page three, it says they used to have seances here. It's just a house. How many are just kind of struggling with this? Like, I don't know. I don't know if I could buy that house. 
And your realtor says, it's just the house. It's just a seance. It's nothing. Or what if, what if some of the songs that we sing here, the worship songs, you, we didn't know this, but we found out later that they were really melodies that were, you know, a Led Zeppelin song or White Snake or Ozzy. We didn't know it. We we're just singing them because it's just bars and notes on a page. How would you respond to that? Uh, you know, you're, we're, we're trying to put it in context. Would, would there be people in the room that came from kind of that dark side of things? You, you, you're just a rocker at heart. Like, you remember that. It's like, I don't know if I can do that anymore. I, it was a dark part of my life. And there's other people like, hey, it's just, just music. And what if those that struggled, what if the other said, it, you just need Knowledge. You, you just need to mature. You just need to grow up. It's, you're the problem here. What if that's how we responded? <laughs> Could you see how that might tear a church apart? That's what was going on in Corinth. And Paul's trying to deal with this issue. Yes, we don't deal with food sacrifice to idols, but we certainly... We certainly insist on having our own way when we think we're in the right at times. The truth is the people that correctly understood that meat offered to idols was nothing were causing their brothers who didn't understand to fall. You see that? The people that had it right were in the wrong. If I were to title my message, that's what it would be. You can be in the right and be in the wrong. Or you can be in the right and not be in the right if you want. And so Paul says, when you cause your brother to stumble, you're sinning against Jesus. That's chapter 8. Chapter 9, he continues the discussion by explaining how because he was an apostle and because he was the, the founding pastor of that church, he was there, as we said in the introduction, longer than anybody else. It, he stayed there longer, I mean, than any other place except Ephesus. In chapter 9, he says, because of my position, I have some rights that others don't have. 1 Corinthians 9, verses 3 through 5, this is my defense to those who would question me or examine me. Um, do we, and he's referring to himself and Silas, do we not have the right to eat and drink? Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife as do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas or Peter? Do we not have the right, he talks about financial support in chapter nine a lot. Do we not have the right for, for financial support? We have that right. If anyone has that right, we have it. I started this church, okay? I'm, I'm, the, I'm the head elder here, if you will. But verse 12, he says, if others share this rightful claim, do we not even have it more? Nevertheless, we've not made use of the right, but we endure anything rather than, be, than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. Verse 15, Paul says, I have made no use of any of these rights, nor am I writing to, to secure these things. It's not my point. Verse 22 and 23, my point is to the weak I became weak that I might win the weak. I become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. I like that. I become all things to all people that just one or two could be saved. I, I, I would be in if all could be saved. Yeah. I become all things to all people if they all get saved. Put me on the street corner, I want to preach. You know, I'll be, I'll be all things to all people, but I want them all to come to Jesus. But Paul said, no, I'll become all things to all people if just some get saved. This is a great perspective of what he had. I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them in its blessings. And finally, I want to read a few chap verses from chapter 10. Uh, even though this isn't part of this week's reading, chapter 10 is a continuation of chapters 8 and 9. Uh, and he, Paul picks up the discussion of eating meat sacrificed to idols in verse 23. So this is chapter 10, verses 23 through chapter 11, verse 1. This is Paul summarizing his argument, and then I'm going to apply it. All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. Eat whatever is sold in the market without raising any questions on the ground of conscience. But if someone says to you, this has been offered and sacrificed, then do not eat it. For the sake of the one who informed you and for the sake of their conscience is what Paul says. 
So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, this is a clue that he's not talking about just eating meat sacrificed to idols. This is about whatever you do. Uh, whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Give no offense to the Jews. Give no offense to the Greeks. No, give no offense to the church of God. Just as I try to please everyone in everything uh, that I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, that, that they may be saved, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. I, I love Paul's final conclusion, his final summary, the final rules for when it comes to eating meat sacrificed to the idol. He says, you just, you go to the market, eat it. Just, just buy it. But if someone says this meat was offered to an idol, that's the end of it. You're not to eat it. Not because of you, but because of them. We, we read these verses, and I don't know if you're anything like me. You read them and you think, I don't even get it. I don't deal with food sacrificed to idols. I, I read these verses five times, easily. Just thought, I, okay, let's get to the next chapter, because it doesn't apply but it does apply. It's how we treat each other. We're not in the right, right? It's the principle that Paul is establishing here. And the thing that we have to remember is this is the second letter that Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. Remember we said in the beginning, we know he wrote another letter, we don't have it. And he addressed it again here. He's readdressing the same issue. And you get to 2 Corinthians, which is the third letter, and he readdresses it again. Because they were still wrestling with, I'm in the right, I'm going to do what I want to do regardless of anybody else. It was tearing a church apart. Think of, think of the relationships that would have been saved had they got it the first time. Think of the momentum they would have secured had they got it the first time. Think of the growth track that church would have been on had they got it the first time, and yet they didn't get it the first time or the second time. Paul had addressed it one more time in second. But I want to just apply this to our lives. It really is about all of us in this room being flexible, yielding, Even if you're in this church and you have the right knowledge and you have years of Christianity behind you and you're as mature as they come, I mean, you just have the right theology, you have the right understanding. Even for you who have it all in the right, Paul would say, even when you have it in the right, we're to yield to one another. This is all about really the, the, the root of the problem here isn't eating meat sacrificed to idols. The root of the problem here is arrogance and conceit, isn't it? I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm in the right. I'm in the right standing before the Lord. My theology is accurate here. I am going to do what I'm going to do, and you're in the wrong. And Paul says, I don't care how right you are. There's a higher law than your theology. There's a higher rule than your rightness. And it's yielding and acquiescing and serving. And that's how you sustain unity in a church. It's how you fight against division. Just a couple of verses. Philippians 2, 3, Paul says, do nothing from selfish ambition. The word there in the Greek for ambition is a cool word. If you look it up in, in your Greek dictionaries, it'll say that it's a picture of a hired hand. Uh, what, what does that mean? Do nothing from the position of a hired hand. But in antiquity, there were two people that would work for you. There were hired hands and there were servants. And a hired hand would say, you don't own me, you owe me. And a servant would say, you owe me. And Paul would say, do nothing from the position of one who's self-willed, who's independent, who, who's like, you don't, you don't own me, you don't tell me what to do. I remember a friend of mine, you've probably all heard this before, but you know, he, he went through several jobs and his fam- fav- favorite line was like, I was looking for a job when I got this one. You know, like, it's kind of like, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. Just rebellious, just conceit, just arrogance. 
great, great worker, talented person. I mean, that's not a new statement, but just arrogant and conceit. And I guess if you want to be that way when it comes to finding a job, maybe that's okay. But in the church, Paul says this, it, never do anything from a position of, you know, you, you owe me. I'm a hired hand. But instead, he says, um, in humility, count others as more significant than yourselves. And if you, if you were in the church in Philippi and you read that, in the Greek, the word that Paul uses there for more significant, I mean, it would have set you back on your heels because what Paul says there is consider others as the governing authority over your life. And remember, they were in the Roman government, the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire was the mafia, I mean, the Gestapo. What they said went. And Paul said, in the relationships that we have in the church, those that are weaker, consider them as your governing authority. Consider them as Caesar. That's, that's how much, that's how high you hold them in your regard. What a powerful thing to say. Do nothing as, as the independent, self-willed, I'm in charge here person, but serve as a servant and see others as those who are your governing authority. Philippians chapter 2, 3, and then in 2, 4 through 6, he says, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourself, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not account equality with God as a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man. It's the... It's the measure for how we carry ourselves in the church. We take on the understanding that Jesus had. We had the mind that Jesus had. Even though he was in the form of God, we say we will become a servant. They are in authority over us. I'm not talking about um, authority. We have to submit to authority, but we just come, we look at people that we go to church with who are broken and who are weak and who struggle with things and we just hold them in high regard. Their theology can be wrong. You know, we just hold them in high regard and we treat them as better than us is really what Paul is saying. Here's this church that was divided because of people's conceit and arrogance and Paul just turns it on its head and he says, treat them as better than you. You see how that, how that would change um, the culture in the church in Corinth? And just again, think what would have happened had they got it the first time. And my hope for us in this room is that we get this, that we get it. But I, I don't know about you. I know for me, I'm 100% in for 40%. I, you know, I, the, the 40% that you like, the 40% that are easy to get along with, I'm 100% in. I'll serve you like I like you're better than me, that I'll, I'll, I'll serve you, I'll honor you. But am, am I the only one? But I'm 100% out for the other 60%. Like that, that's just human nature. You annoy me, you're needy, um, or whatever. Like I, I, I'm not, I'm not going to serve you the way that Paul wants me to serve you. That, that's just human nature. That's in every church, in every city. It, it's... It's not just in the world, it's, it's everywhere. And Paul says, no. We're here to consider one another as better. And can you imagine the unity that a house like ours, just our church, the unity and the momentum and the effectiveness, 11 men got together in unity In Acts 2, and they changed their world. 11 men and 120 others, but 110 others. But they were in unity, the Bible says, because they looked at each other differently than the world. And that's the message of 1 Corinthians 8, 9, and 10. It's not about food being sacrificed to idols. Colossians 3, 12, put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Put on means to wear it. Wear compassion. Wear kindness. Wear humility. 
wear patience, wear meekness. And that's a, that's a great outfit you have on this morning. Thank you. It's my patience. Man, that's a beautiful, whatever, pair of shoes. That's my kindness. Did anybody come to church naked today? Hopefully not. We, we put our clothes on generally to cover up things, don't we? Cover yourself up with compassionate hearts and kindness and humility is what Paul is saying. Ephesians 5.12, submit to one another out of reverence. The word there, reverence, is phobos, phobia, where we get our word, fear, terror for Christ. Submit to one another out of fear for Christ. How will we respond? Paul said in Romans 2.8, those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth will receive wrath and fury. This is serious stuff. Church, I want us to walk in unity. Amen. Would you just raise your hands where you're seated? And I want to just read these statements that we read earlier. These are things Paul said. And just receive these for you. In whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Give no offense. Instead, try to please everyone. Just, just receive that. Do not seek your own advantage. That's a hard thing for, for so many. To the weak, become weak. Endure anything rather than put up an obstacle. Take care that your right doesn't somehow become a stumbling block to others. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Amen. Hallelujah. You can put your hands down. Lord, we want to receive this. I want to receive this word. I want to be 100% for 100%. And Lord, our flesh fights against it. And that, it isn't the first time we've spoken about it and it won't be the last, just like it wasn't for the church at Corinth. Lord, we need reminded of this and re-reminded of this. Lord, we want to assume the mind that you had, Jesus, when you emptied yourself and became a servant. Lord, may that be our heart towards one another. May it be our heart towards the person that's annoying person that's wounded, the person that's weak, the person that's needy, Lord, that we would serve each other for your glory, that more might be saved. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing this song together. Oh, to Jesus I surrender all. To hear my freely give, I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily. And I surrender all. I surrender all all to Jesus my blessed Savior I surrender all I surrender all and I surrender all oh, and I surrender Savior, I surrender all. Mm, God loves you so much. So good, isn't he? All the time. You guys have a great week. Um, don't forget to go to your connect groups. We'll see you next Sunday here, first or second service. Don't forget, your potluck is in two weeks. All right, God bless you.